In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, dear guests, uh, may the peace of God be upon you. You are welcome to this uh, third session. Oil is considered uh, one of the aspects uh, of uh, energy and it is a strategic uh, product uh, for several entities whether the producer, the seller, the purchaser or the consumer and oil for producing uh, company, uh, uh, countries is a main pillar of the national uh, economy we talk about oil taking into consideration that other sources of energy like wind or solar energy or nuclear energy or the, from the sea as important as they are did not reach the importance of oil when it comes to the national economy and international economies and uh, there are several security concerns r related uh, to the geostrategic uh, relationship between the crisis of uh, energy and international security and uh, there's an obvious uh, link between oil as an as a source and international interests for big uh, countries that consider the uh, producing uh, areas under the influence of the Western countries based on uh, the uh, security concerns of the international oil companies. I would like uh, to introduce uh, the uh, speakers uh, who will talk about the importance of security and its uh, link with the production of energy that should reach uh, the industrial zones and areas essential to the international economic uh, movement and the international competition represents uh, the core of the, of the industrial uh, area uh, we will be talking uh, in details about the US GCC relations during this third session uh, dear uh, panelists, you've got 15 minutes and we will start with the first speaker, Dr. Abdullah Baboud, who will present uh, a paper entitled Elusive Energy Self-Sufficiency and the Future of the U.S. Role in the Gulf. He is uh, uh, the director of the uh, Gulf Studies at Qatar University and he worked at the Cambridge University in the past in the U.K. He got a master's degree in uh, business management and uh, in international relationships and uh, he got a doctorate, a PhD uh, from the UK. Dr. Abdullah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. May the peace of God be upon you. I will be talking uh, about uh, my paper entitled the elusive energy self-sufficiency and the future of the u.s role in the gulf as it is well known and uh, was mentioned energy is one of the most important economic aspects when it comes to the security of any country especially uh, when it comes to international policies in this context the u.s and securing uh, source uh, energy sources uh, to all citizens of any given country is considered uh, an essential uh, pillar of the U.S. Uh, economic strength and allows the U.S. to play a leadership role all over the world. Energy affects uh, all aspects uh, of the uh, U.S. Uh, politics and plays uh, an essential role when it comes to national interests of the United States that builds its relationship with other uh, countries based on these interests. For these reasons and other reasons, securing uh, sources uh, for the U.S. citizens or the allies outside the U.S. was one of, one of the main important uh, interests of the U.S. Uh, long ago 
and securing uh, the sources uh, of energy was an important factor when it comes to the interest of the U.S. Uh, and the Middle East region. This is according to the opinion of uh, international experts, although there are other areas uh, of interest uh, when it comes to politics and strategic interests. So the U.S. dream uh, of uh, self-sufficiency was adopted in the U.S. since the first petroleum crisis in 1973 during the war of October and uh, since then the US has planned to reduce relying on the oil sources from the Middle East. This dream started to be shaped in a different way after September 11 and the deficit of the US uh, starting 2008 uh, because of the high cost of energy. So this big uh, deficit uh, was a challenge uh, to uh, decision makers in the US uh, to secure the oil source or the sources of energy, not only from the GCC, but from all other countries. Washington has adopted new uh, uh, technologies uh, and uh, uh, discovering new oil uh, wells and uh, starting to use some reserves and uh, push or uh, encourage uh, discoveries in the U.S especially in the area of uh, Alaska. This has allowed new uh, oil discoveries, important oil discoveries in uh, the Gulf of Mexico near uh, California and uh, to increase the production of oil in Alaska and a new pipeline was established and there was a projection that the U.S. will re rely on self-sufficiency based on several uh, studies that studied the impact of uh, the self-sufficiency on Washington's foreign policy. Of course, the United States plays a major role when it comes to gas and oil, although that the number of uh, the U.S. population is uh, 314 million, but it is the uh, biggest consumer of oil and gas in the world. In 2012, the daily consumption of the U.S. was equivalent to 18 million barrels. 0.6 of oil and oil products, and it represents almost 21% of the international oil production. 21.6, uh, or it, it has produced uh, 6.5 and imported 11 uh, billion. And China is the second uh, international consumer, but with a wide difference. When it comes to natural gas, the U.S. is the first consumer. It has consumed uh, 25 trillion cubic uh, feet. Russia uh, was the second. And uh, the, oil, uh, the gas produced uh, uh, by the U.S. was f uh, t uh, 95 percent in 2012 and imported only 5% from abroad, so 1.4 uh, uh, trillion cubic meter. And uh, the uh, gas was secured uh, by a pipeline from Canada, uh, so 24% of the imports. When it comes to the remaining uh, imports, uh, it was the liquefied uh, uh, LNG uh, via shipments from Egypt, Qatar, Yemen, and other uh, countries. And these statistics reveal the importance uh, of the U.S. when it comes to identifying the international demand in oil and gas and to, how, to what extent uh, Washington relies on importing uh, uh, so, uh, resources, natural resources, and oil and gas resources. And uh, the dream of uh, Republicans and Democrats as well was to uh, reduce relying on foreign countries when it comes to uh, energy efficiency in order to free the U.S. from uh, its international relations when it comes to the national security issues, so from uh, areas uh, witnessing turmoil. Uh, 
and uh, the U.S. wanted to stop relying on these areas. Uh, this dream, uh, according to many, is about to be achieved. Uh, after uh, 40 years after Richard Nixon uh, decided or uh, announced uh, the uh, energy efficiency program uh, to limit uh, the uh, reliance of uh, the U.S. on foreign uh, oil, and uh, the Americans dream about achieving uh, this uh, self-sufficiency starting 2020, based on the increase of the cost of local uh, production and uh, the increase of uh, energy efficiency efforts. Uh, the national production of oil, of energy, increased by 30% in 2012 compared to 2008. Uh, so uh, they have uh, started using the technology of shale oil and shale gas. And uh, they have uh, used a new technology, uh, the hydraulic fracturing process. It is a new technology uh, to uh, extract oil and gas uh, by using uh, uh, water uh, cascade uh, with a high pressure, and uh, this is an important source of energy in the U.S. Uh, so uh, for long it was believed that uh, the conventional method couldn't allow extracting these uh, gas and oil resources. On the other hand, uh, the consumption was reduced by 17% in 2012 compared uh, to the level of consumption in 2005 as a result of the uh, financial crisis. And uh, with this increase of production and reduction of uh, consumption, uh, the imports uh, uh, decreased, uh, so the oil imports in 2012 were 42% of the entire uh, imports, however it was 60% in 2005. Canada is the biggest uh, uh, exporter of uh, crude oil to the U.S. and uh, it has exported 18% uh, 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 13% percent for KSA and uh, the remaining uh, of imports uh, of US imports uh, uh, came from other uh, countries these uh, uh, developments uh, had pushed uh, the international uh, uh, energy agency in November 2012 uh, expected that the US will reach a self sufficiency by 20 35. And uh, the uh, energy agency said that uh, the U.S. will become the biggest produ pro producer of uh, gas uh, in the world in 2015 based on the shale gas uh, uh, technology and uh, the biggest uh, producer of uh, crude oil in 2020. And the U.S. Uh, might become an exporter of uh, energy sources uh, of crude oil and uh, gas and petroleum products. These were the expectations and projections, and several scenarios were drawn. So is the self-sufficiency of the U.S. and becoming an exporter of uh, energy, would that change of the strategy of the U.S. Uh, in this region or not? There are several scenarios that are being stu studied and that uh, tackle this point. The U.S. might uh, rely on internal policies because it has got the internal energy it does not need uh, to concern uh, to be concerned uh, when it comes to the GCC area or the Gulf or the Middle East in general. 
There's another scenario that con uh, considers that the U.S. is an international uh, power and it cannot uh, uh, distance itself from the international market. It is part, uh, an even part of its uh, job and mission to manage the international economy. So. Uh, the world would rely on the U.S. when it comes to energy, and it is very important uh, for the U.S. to have the oil uh, at reasonable prices for other international economies because the growth of the international economy is very important to the U.S. economy. In this situation, the U.S. cannot distance itself from international politics. It will uh, carry on with its policies in the area, in the region, for several reasons. There's another factor as well. If the U.S. reduces relying on Arab oil, it does not mean that uh, the U.S. is no longer concerned uh, when it comes to or interested in other areas. Indirect means what is known uh, under the name of virtual oil. I mean by virtual oil, as you know, uh, energy is uh, an inherent part of several uh, manufacturing processes, and uh, these uh, products will eventually reach uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, so the oil or energy is one of the most important pillars of the manufacturing process. Energy is very important to the life of humans and no country whatsoever can distance itself uh, from dealing with uh, this uh, issue. On the other hand, there are several topics that are of utmost importance that made uh, or will make uh, the U.S. Uh, carry on with its uh, policies in the region. The U.S. Uh, does not rely uh, on uh, Arab oil only. Uh, it has uh, several strategic uh, interests, uh, especially the relationship uh, with Israel, its close ally, and its protection of Israel as well. And uh, one of the most important uh, issues in the region uh, that uh, drive the U.S. Uh, to care about that, the increase of uh, extremism. You know uh, this extremism uh, is starting to affect some countries in the region, and uh, the major changes after the Arab Spring, the Arab revolutions, uh, the uh, nuclear dossier of uh, Iran, and uh, the growth of the GCC economy uh, that is today one of the most important economies in the world when it comes to growth rates and uh, the cumulative growth uh, uh, in the region, uh, sovereign funds uh, that are regulating uh, several economic uh, resources. Uh, the U.S. is uh, almost relying on uh, these uh, Gulf resources when it comes to the U.S. dollar, the U.S. currency and especially in times of crisis. Of course, uh, we all know that uh, GCC countries are buying U.S. bonds in order to uh, boost the U.S. economy. And uh, there is uh, important, uh, or it is very uh, important to the U.S. The future of this region is very important. Iran uh, or the U.S. knows that uh, this region is still incapable of protecting itself. Uh, there is a U.S. force, uh, or big U.S. Uh, force, deployed uh, military bases and several uh, U.S. Uh, soldiers deployed here in the region. And, uh, of course, uh, we have the important uh, weapons uh, purchases uh, that the U.S. Uh, uh, economy cannot do away with. Uh, thank you for your time.
We'd like to thank Mr. Abdullah Abboud for the statistics and also the information that he gave us regarding this very important topic. So we're going to have Dr. Daniel Sawyer, who is going to talk about the quicksand and also is going to talk about the international markets. He is a researcher and also he is also uh, a uh, uh, working in John Hopkins uh, Institute. He is also a researcher in the Institute of the Middle East, uh, and also he worked as a president and also deputy president in the Peace Institute in the United States of America. He got a PhD from Princeton University. Uh, Dr. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I have to admire the wisdom of the organizers because I'm going to start where Dr. Baboud left off, uh, and that is trying to answer the question, will changes in energy markets affect U.S. policy? But I'm going to give a somewhat different answer from his. I'm going to say yes, they will affect U.S. policies. And I want to underline to you right up front, uh, caveat emptor. Uh, that is, buyer beware, I'm not talking as a U.S. official. I am looking forward five and ten years imagining what U.S. officials may do to react to a situation that has come about rather rapidly and suddenly. And that is a rapid increase in oil and gas production inside the United States and in the Western Hemisphere more generally. Uh, at the same moment that energy demand is rising very rapidly in the Eastern Hemisphere. And this is a remarkable change. It's been occurring with virtually no change in oil prices. Oil prices have been remarkably stable for the last three years, despite many crises around the world. And I think it is largely due to the availability of this new oil and gas. I hasten to add also that quite apart from these changes in oil and gas markets, I don't believe that military means are necessarily the best means with which to protect the Gulf. The problem is, as soon as you talk about sending a minesweeper to the Gulf, the price goes up. Well, what you're trying to avoid, what energy security is all about, is getting adequate supplies at reasonable prices. So uh, if you do something to keep the strait open that raises oil prices sharply, you've defeated yourself. I want to talk about what the policy implications are and what the alternative means of what I call circumventing Hormuz are. First and foremost, if demand is increasing mainly in India and China, I think India and China will have to accept more of the burden of being prepared for oil supply disruptions. And the main way in which Western countries, coordinated in the International Energy Agency, prepare for oil supply disruptions is to hold stocks and to draw down stocks early in the crisis. Uh, China and India hold less than 30 days of stocks. IEA requirements are 90 days. Uh, American diplomats are already quite properly talking to Delhi, New Delhi and to uh, Beijing about increasing their stocks. In fact, there has even been some talk about China joining the OECD. Uh, I think this is very important and a major contribution to oil market stability if we can get India and China to hold stocks at the levels that the West already holds stocks. Secondly, a pipelines. Now, Saudi Arabia does have, a pi does have pipelines. Uh, the UAE has a new pipeline. Uh, but these pipelines are still uh, relatively small contributors to exports from the Gulf. I believe there's much more potential for pipelines. The potential is in part in increasing 
the, the usage of existing pipelines. You can use friction for reducing agents that significantly increase their capacity at reasonable cost. You can also build new pipelines. The Iraqis, before the latest troubles, uh, had been talking with the Jordanians about a pipeline to Aqaba. Uh, if uh, Iraq and Saudi Arabia could ever uh, settle their differences, uh, an Iraqi pipeline through Saudi Arabia would make a great deal of sense. Frankly, an Iraqi pipeline to the north would have made a great deal of sense, and I think will again make a great deal of sense one day. The Americans made a big mistake, in my view, investing all their efforts in improving the export facilities in Iraq South, rather than fixing the strategic pipeline and enabling Iraq to export southern oil also to the north. Uh, Qatar has had some plans for gas pipelines to the northwest, and I think the current situation in Ukraine is going to put a premium on finding alternatives to Russian gas for Ukraine and for Western Europe. So I think there are lots of possibilities with pipelines. A third area uh, is a very sensitive one, and I want to be very clear about what I mean. And that's the question of how military naval protection is provided for the Strait of Hormuz. As things stand, it's primarily an American responsibility with a lot of contributions from the Gulf countries in terms of basing and armaments and a lot of other things. Uh, I don't, I don't think that's wise. Uh, I think uh, we need a multinational force to protect the Strait of Hormuz. I think the Chinese should be invited to participate in that multinational force. Why? Because I know that Iran will not attack uh, a navy of a country that is taking more than half of its oil uh, and that's being exported through Hormuz. Uh, this may sound radical, especially to American ears it sounds radical, but the Chinese already do patrol in the Arabian Sea for pirates. There's really no reason at all uh, why they shouldn't be invited if there were a multinational force uh, to protect Hormuz. That, of course, isn't going to come about. None of this is going to happen until after the nuclear question with Iran is resolved. And here I have to talk about scenarios a little bit. The Americans are going to keep their military forces in the Gulf. They may even beef them up uh, in, in the, in, as part of the uh, negotiating strategy. There are basically three scenarios, I think, uh, with Iran. One is that there's an agreement. People in the Gulf worry a great deal about that. But really, I don't think there's much to worry about. Iran, if it reaches a nuclear agreement with the United States, will be liberated from a certain number of multilateral sanctions that have affected its oil sector. But I, I have grave doubts that they'll get much above their million barrels a day from before uh, the sanctions. And I don't think they'll get it anywhere near the three million a day uh, that were produced during the Shah's time. To get anywhere near that three million barrels per day, they need a lot of American technology. They're not going to get it unless there's a much broader than nuclear agreement. The prospects for that broader agreement are not very good. There are many reasons why they're not good, but basically they're not good because the Americans won't take a broader agreement unless there's an end to Iranian subversion in the Gulf and elsewhere, support to Hamas, pardon me, <laughs> uh, and, and uh, a, a general change of attitude, not only about Iran's behavior abroad, but also about Iran's internal political behavior. 
That kind of agreement seems far off, frankly. And then it's, not, uh, it's not an option for the Obama administration unless it can get the Congress to go along with it. And the American political spectrum is not feeling warmly towards this idea. Uh, it's feeling no more warmly than many of the Gulf states feel about it, uh, in particular Saudi Arabia. So there's the prospect of an agreement. That's scenario one. There's the prospect of war. Uh, war is truly catastrophic for all concerned, it seems to me. Uh, you can expect uh, oil to go to at least $200 a barrel, if not more. You can expect some permanent damage to oil production and distribution facilities, not only in Iran, but also probably elsewhere in the Gulf. And at $200 a barrel, frankly, all the alternatives, all the known alternatives to oil are economic. And that $200 a barrel could last for a long time. The war may not last for a long time, but the uncertainty might last for a long time because, frankly, destruction of Iran, Iran's nuclear facilities isn't going to end their nuclear program. It, it, it is likely only to uh, cause them to try to accelerate it, and that will, in turn, create greater uncertainty. So war is catastrophic for oil markets, is catastrophic for oil producers, it's catastrophic for oil consumers, it's pretty good for solar energy. Uh, the third scenario is the one nobody likes to talk about, but the, the Israelis fear the most in some respects, and that is containment. That is that the current temporary agreement, the so-called joint plan of action, would become permanent and that Iran would have uh, 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 limited stocks of enriched uranium, but vastly increased centrifuge capacity with which to quickly uh, move towards nuclear weapons. That too is a very unstable situation. It's a situation in which the Gulf countries find themselves in the middle, in the middle of a nuclear standoff between Israel and, uh, and Iran, and I think it's a very bad picture for uh, oil markets and for oil producers. Uh, so much as people are critical of the idea of an agreement with Iran on nuclear questions, look at the alternatives. It looks a hell of a lot better. Let me say a word also about a broader subject that is hard for foreigners to talk about, and that is sectarian tensions in the Gulf. Uh, they go right through the Gulf. They may go right through this room, for all I know. I think oil and gas markets uh, need, uh, in the long term, a much they need you to be active in overcoming, not the physical gulf, but the figurative gulf between Sunni and Shia. Uh, this ultimately may be the greatest threat uh, to world oil and gas markets. And I know it's not fundamentally a religious threat. It's a political threat. It's a question of identity politics fundamentally. Uh, I don't have the answer for you. I do like to quote what Benjamin Franklin said when faced with, uh, with the British forces during the American Revolution. He said, either we all hang together or we all hang, that is this way, separately. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, it's time to begin thinking about uh, a scenario in which the nuclear question is somehow successfully resolved. The Americans start reducing their forces in the Gulf. Maybe they even create a multinational force to protect Hormuz. Uh, 
maybe they do some of these, maybe you do some of these other things I've suggested, building up pipelines and that kind of thing. And then you have to think about collective security in the Gulf, and it's, it's none too soon to be thinking about that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Daniel, uh, for uh, your, uh, this uh, word. And uh, the, uh, now we'll move to Dr. Uh, Frederick uh, Wiley. He uh, will present a paper entitled Saudi American Relations in a Changing Middle East. Dr. Frederick uh, works with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and focuses on security, politics, and the Gulf, Libya, and the U.S. Uh, policies vis-à-vis -vis the Middle East, and he has worked as a political analyst, grant, uh, yes, Institute, and uh, he has a book about uh, the uh, denomination politics in the Gulf. He has a PhD from Oxford. Dr. Frederick, where the floor is yours. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I hope that uh, uh, we uh, will have a fruitful uh, discussion. I will be speaking in English. The, the topic of my, my paper is, is Saudi-U.S. discord, and, and I had a subtitle in that, in that title, uh, Buffeted but Not Broken. In, in other words, this is a bilateral relationship that is under strain, that is undergoing turbulence, but that is not broken. And certainly I think the, the, the complaints and the alarm that we've seen from Saudi Arabia uh, have been unprecedented and should be taken seriously. Obviously, they predate uh, uh, really the, the current round of, of malaise. We can, we can track them really back to the, the opening shots of the Arab uprisings, the Arab Spring. Uh, but I think they really picked up um, with, uh, <coughs> with the uh, ejection of, of Mohamed Morsi from, from Egypt, with what the Saudis saw as a naive capitulation to Iranian nuclear ambitions with the ongoing negotiations the hesitation and really paralysis of the United States uh, are in Syria, Washington's announcement of a strategic pivot to Asia, uh, it's Washington's inward uh, domestic focus, the, the sense that we're a country that's consumed by economic troubles, the withdrawals of, of our military forces from Iraq and Afghanistan. I think the net result of all of this is the growing sense in Saudi Arabia and Gulf capitals that the U.S. is a power in retreat in the region, ignoring the interests of its steadfast partners, if not blithely betraying them or abandoning them. Now this sense of Saudi abandonment uh, from the United States is not new. And I would argue it's, it's, a, it's really deeply etched into the, into the structure of this bilateral relationship. It's part of the DNA of the Saudi-US relationship. We've seen also threats of greater unilateralism and even a divorce from the Saudis before, throughout history. We can go back uh, to 9-11, we can go back to the Iraq War, uh, when the Saudis felt the U.S. wasn't doing enough there. We can go back to the 2007 trilateral talks with Iran in Baghdad when the Saudis believed they were being shut out of negotiations o over Iraq. Uh, and as David mentioned, we can go back further to history with the oil embargo. I'd go further back, and I'm going to mention this in my presentation, to the Nasser period. This is, this is a period when, when the Saudis were confronted, as they are today, with an ideological power, a hegemon. Uh, certainly they faced cooperation with the United States against that power, but there was this sense from the Saudis that President Kennedy was not doing enough to confront Nasser, that we were dealing with him behind their back. If you go through the archives and you read the Saudi statements, you find almost the same script that we're, that we're hearing today. So again, I think as a smaller state dependent on a more powerful patron, the Saudis and the GCC have always faced two things really, abandonment or entrapment, the idea that the United States will entrap the Saudis in a war of Washington's making. So certainly in response to these fears, Saudi Arabia has undertaken an increasingly activist and assertive foreign policy. And in many cases, these policies have opposed and undercut U.S. interests, but I'm going I'm to argue not fatally so, not catastrophically so. Saudi Arabia has also called for a more muscular Gulf defense policy to include a united military command. They've issued threats about seeking patronage elsewhere. 
What I'm going to argue uh, in the rest of my time is that despite these disagreements, the relationship is still on solid ground. And there are really four factors, I think, that, that mitigate against a real break in U.S.-Saudi relations. The first one is that despite a number of overtures to Asian or South Asian powers for arms and trade, uh, despite this sort of flirtation that we're seeing with, with buying arms, Riyadh really has no real alternative right now to the security guarantees offered by the United States. And indeed, if we look throughout its history, Saudi Arabia has always been, if I can use the term, polygamous a bit in its security relationships with other great power patrons as a hedge against uncertainty with its primary patron, the United States. And this trend was evident during the Nasser period. Uh, what you found was after President Kennedy recognized the UAR, the, the, the Saudis got upset, they reestablished relations with the British, whom they had cut relations with, and they invited in the British to help train and modernize the Saudi National Guard. So again, diversifying your portfolio as a hedge against uncertainty with the United States. What are they doing now? I think they're going around um, trying to fill certain niche capabilities, uh, frigate, satellite intelligence, tanks, visits to Indonesia. But in terms of that fundamental sort of almost existential uh, security partner, who are you gonna call in your darkest hour? Nobody's really filling the role of the United States, I, I've argued. Certainly, and I agree with Dan, there should be more multilateralism in the Gulf. The Chinese can be involved. In, in patrols, but in terms of that real, real uh, reassurance, I think the U.S. is still the only game in town. What are the problems with the other countries? I think, again, there's been certainly interest in China through South-South trade. Uh, China has overtaken the U.S. as the world's biggest importer, but I see the Chinese still as a free rider in terms of Gulf security. They're happy to let the United States play the role of the policeman while they pursue trade. Europe is often cited as another partner. Collectively, the EU is the Gulf's biggest trading partner. But we've been down this road before with Europe trying to provide security for the Gulf with the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative. This really ended up being a bilateral uh, affair. Uh, Kuwait, Qatar, the UAE, Bahrain accepted. Saudi Arabia, Oman did not. Um, so again, if we go down the list of all these different powers, whether Russia, India, Pakistan, there are all real problems in terms of the politics of these countries, their capacity, their willpower. Uh, the second point is that this notion that somehow the Gulf will evolve into a watertight defense block that can actually provide collective security for its own affairs, I think is, is likely to be elusive. Uh, obviously due to endemic mistrust, interoperability issues, divisions, most recently, Saudi Arabia announced as a way to distance itself from the United States that we're setting up this, own, this United Military Command. When I talked to people at the Pentagon, they were actually ecstatic about that. They were happy about that because that's something that the DOD, the Department of Defense and the Pentagon, have been actually pushing for for quite some time. Uh, if you remember Secretary of Defense his Hegel, uh, Hegel's speech, uh, recently, there was this uh, uh, initiative to start selling arms to the GCC as a collective whole. There, there have been a number of other initiatives by the United States to try to get the GCC focused as a more operational military entity. Defense, defense ministerial meetings, the Security Cooperation Forum hosted by the State Department. But all of these, as we know, I think have foundered due to mutual distrust and real questions about uh, command and control uh, issues. Uh, I won't get into the specific differences of the Gulf states, obviously they're, they're well known. I will say that I think if anything the, the movement on an Iranian nuclear deal will make this disunity within the Gulf even more uh, fractious, really complicating Saudi Arabia's efforts to forge a consensus, a defense consensus uh, in the Gulf. And I think the United States increasingly will be, will be faced with a, with a very fractious Gulf perhaps two completing, competing blocks within the Gulf. Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and the UAE on the one hand with Oman and Qatar and possibly Kuwait uh, pursuing a more unilateral path uh, that balances cooperation with the US with military engagement with Iran. If there are really two potentially hopeful areas for real multi, uh, multilateral military cooperation in the Gulf, it's our maritime security. Uh, this is where the, the, the political cost is relatively low for these states. 
and you already have some of the existing structure in place in terms of the, the hardware, the C2, uh, you have the, the combined maritime force already in place. Com uh, ballistic missile defense is gonna be much, much harder uh, due to problems of system integration and really trust and, and political will. So I think the notion of the GCC, despite what the Saudis have announced as functioning as a real uh, military entity is, is a way, ways off. The third factor, the notion that somehow these negotiations with Iran, and, we, and we've already heard this before, somehow these negotiations with Iran are going to fundamentally uh, re-engineer the U.S.-Iranian relationship or result in some sort of game-changing shift in geopolitics that, that brings the United States closer to Iran is a bit misplaced. Um, if, it went, if and when this breakthrough occurs, uh, it's going to be more uncertain, it's probably going to be less seismic than both optimists and Washington and Saudi alarmists believe. Um, if anything, the United States is trying to push the Saudis uh, towards some sort of, of, of relationship with Iran that is not marked by open proxy warfare, some sort of cold detente. Uh, President uh, Obama gave a very revealing speech in The New Yorker in which he argued that the Gulf and Iran should some, somehow reach some sort of equilibrium. He used that term, equilibrium. Again, inviting the, the comparison with, with the days of, of Nixon and the Shah, that somehow this region would, ach would achieve a balance that would facilitate a lessening of the U.S. presence and a pivot to Asia. I've authored a piece on the Carnegie website with my colleague Kareem Sajapur that argues that this notion of an equilibrium between Saudi Arabia and Iran is still a very ways off, uh, due obviously to domestic politics within each country, and most importantly to the region, what is happening in the region right now, uh, the Syria conflict being the most uh, important of those. In Washington these days, there's been a lot of workshops and, and um, thinking about uh, what it would take to have a Saudi-Iranian detente, and there's been some comparisons to the 1990s. What can we learn from that uh, period? And, and I'll just briefly argue that I think the, the, the two eras are completely different, both in terms of the region and also the domestic politics in each state and the economic challenges that both countries uh, are facing today or were facing in the 90s that they're not facing uh, today that, that totally uh, make this analogy, I think, misplaced. Um, the, the fourth reason, I think, um, that we often overlook is that the pillars, the, the long-standing pillars of Saudi-U.S. cooperation uh, are still strong. Despite this disagreement on the region, on, on regional order, beneath the surface, counterterrorism cooperation remains absolutely, fundamentally unchanged, I would argue, and it will perhaps even grow stronger in light of what we're seeing, unfortunately, next door uh, in Iraq. And moreover, the other fundamental pillar, military assistance, remains strong as well. When I talk to people at the Department of Defense uh, recently, there's this sense that it's business as usual. They're able to compartmentalize, if you will, what is happening with the Saudis or in Egypt or in Syria or in Iran with the military assistance, which they see as proceeding unimpeded. Again, a $60 billion arms package to the Saudis is proceeding as planned. It was ironic that on the day the Saudis withdrew their ambassador from the United Nations uh, or, or turned down the seat from the uh, United Nations Security Council, they received a shipment of advanced bunker-busting munitions from the United States. Um, so U.S. cooperation is proceeding uh, at a very rapid pace. It's expanding. The U.S. is expanding the Fifth Fleet headquarters. It's increased the tempo of its foreign military sales uh, over the region, to the region over the past six years. Much of the origins of this activity predate the current round of discord, but what it does is it serves to reinforce Washington's message of reassurance. And you find this theme of reassurance throughout uh, U.S. policy officials' uh, statements and speeches. The priority now uh, among the United States, uh, within the United States defense establishment, is really fourfold, I would argue. Encourage multilateralism within the Gulf, build the capacity of the Gulf uh, defense forces, ensure U.S. access, and promote reform. Let me just close with, with really what I see as, as one potential area of concern where U.S. officials do in fact need to be concerned about a divergence with Saudi Arabia and do dev need to dev uh, devote more attention, and that is that last issue of reform. 
I think that in the, in the process of trying to reassure the Saudis and to sort of solicit Riyadh's support on what is happening in the region, on U.S. diplomatic initiatives and, and regional policy, U.S. officials are overlooking some very worrisome domestic trends uh, in Saudi Arabia. I think a real turn toward uh, repression, if you will, because of what is happening in the region. We've seen this uh, obviously in the, in the criminalization of the Muslim Brotherhood, these sweeping anti-terrorism laws. Um, on top of that, you have these very worrisome domestic trends, the youth bulge, unemployment, a crumbling infrastructure. I won't get into all of these, and I'm not gonna join the, uh, the cottage industry, if you will, of people that are predicting uh, the imminent implosion of Saudi Arabia. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But I do think the United States, not solely from a, from a value-based perspective, but from a security perspective uh, and a strategic perspective, does need to pay more attention to what is happening inside the kingdom uh, in light of these, these recent developments and make reform a greater part of its, of its security strategy. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll close. Thank you. نشكر الدكتور نشكر الدكتور فريدريك على هذه الكلمة وإبراز العلاقة Dr. Frederick, and he talked about the relationship between the uh, United States and Saudi Arabia in the light of the changes and transformations that have taken place in the region. We would like now to give the floor to his uh, Mr. Sahim Al Thani, who is going to talk about the U.S. Qatari relations, trends, and dimensions. He is a researcher in the Arab Center for Research. He has got uh, many uh, of the studies uh, and also papers in the peer review magazine and he is specialized in international relations in Royal Holloway and we'd like to give him the floor now we have got 15 minutes thank you very much dr. Mohammed As you said in the title, you talked about the dimensions of the U.S. Qatar relations and the different uh, trends. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the exportation of the United States of oil and gas and the Pacific. In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful, the relationship between the United States and uh, the USA has witnessed uh, great proximity in different levels, educational, uh, economic, and so on and so forth. Although we have seen uh, many differences and difficulties in these relations, we have seen the development in recent years between the two countries, and this did not impact the nature of this relationship, which was a very strategic relationship, this paper aims to shed light on the most important aspects of the relationship between the United States of America and the state of Qatar. And also, it tries uh, to see the main factors that can have an impact on this relationship in the coming years. The policy in the Pacific and also the exploration of many, many, uh, a lot of quantities of shale gas uh, because uh, uh, the United States, which is becoming one of the most exporters of uh, fossil fuel in the world, and this will lead uh, to self-sufficiency in the United States, and this will have an impact on the uh, balance of powers in the world, and this will lead to a decrease in the prices of oil and gas, and this is going to have a negative negative impact on the economies of the region and also it will lead to an impact on the balance of powers in this country. If this happens, this is going to be a challenge for the state of Qatar and it will lead to an increase uh, in uh, its uh, in, uh, uh, reliance on the relationship with the United States. So if uh, the uh, stability is destabilized in the region, especially in Iran, which would be very much impacted in any destabilization in terms of the uh, decrease in the prices of oil. A most important variables in Qatari uh, policy in the last decade came through the support of the state of Qatar of the Arab Spring. The United States of America supported the Arab Spring in the beginning, and there was a cooperation, military cooperation between the United States in the NATO alliance and the United States against the Libyan regime in Syria. Uh, uh, Qatar was very much enthusiastic compared to 
the United States and after the thinking changed vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Syrian revolution because they have started talking about the terrorism rather than talking about the crimes committed by the regime, the importance and the interest of the United States in Syria retreated. But this does not impact the relationship between the Qatar and the United States, although they have not agreed much upon the uh, Syrian file and this has led to a decrease in the interest of the United States in the uh, Middle East. Uh, and their position has changed when we talk about the era of uh, uh, George Bush. If you are not with us, you're against us. Now the situation is different. And although the military retreat uh, from Afghanistan uh, uh, from, from Afghanistan and other uh, regions has led to the uh, lack of stability and chaos, and this has an impact on security in the region. The United States policy, foreign policy, heads uh, towards Asia as one of its main aims and objectives, and there isn't coordination between the state of Qatar and the United States in this respect. Uh, what remains for the United States in terms of interest uh, is uh, to retreat uh, from uh, uh, Afghanistan and Iran and try to reach a kind of an agreement between Palestine and also uh, uh, Israel. It is noticed that the United States does not coordinate uh, with the state of Qatar in these files, uh, although f uh, the state of Qatar has been very successful in many mediations uh, that they have conducted with many, many components in the region, including Hamas and other components. The United States has coordinated with uh, uh, the uh, Qatar uh, as far as the retreat from uh, the uh, from uh, from Afghanistan, and it's allowed also the uh, Taliban to open an office here in Qatar, and they attempted also to reach an agreement between uh, Taliban and the Afghan uh, government, uh, but uh, uh, this uh, uh, initiative was halted when uh, the Afghan government uh, was uh, opposing such a movement and uh, there was a kind of a uh, negotiation with Taliban vis-à-vis uh, -vis the, uh, the uh, prisoners and they had the last, uh, I mean, American prisoners still in Afghanistan. So this is the only file in which Qatar played a role uh, in all American files in the region. And Qatar does not play in any diplomatic, clear diplomatic role in any of uh, United States files or uh, foreign files. Uh, so the United States is going to interact with the region, but uh, at a lesser level compared to last decades since the uh, discovery of oil in the uh, Middle East. And this uh, decrease uh, in the United States presence in the region is going to be to have an impact on the relationship between Qatar and the United States. Uh, and this is very much clear in the lack of coordination between the United States and Qatar in many of the files. We are talking about the economic and security impact and also the discovery of the United States of oil and gas. So the security impact after the discovery of many, of huge amounts of oil and, and gas to reduce uh, the interest of the United States uh, uh, interest in the region because of the, they do not need as much uh, these, uh, I mean, the, the oil and gas in the region. And also this is going to lead to the fact that their allies also they are not going to leave these sources of uh, oil and gas uh, and this means that they are not going to rely as much on these uh, uh, supplies from this region and uh, this will lead to concentrate on the Pacific and also try to concentrate on their competitor the Chinese competitor and uh, and the influence will not be as strong as it used to be if there is any destabilization because they do not fear any increase in the prices of oil and gas, uh, the prices of oil and gas. Uh, 
and it is possible uh, that there would be a kind of a Russian hegemony because uh, Russia is going to be very much impacted if the United States starts uh, exporting uh, oil and gas or they will start working on their own or in cooperation with Iran in order to expand their hegemony and also to overcome any difficulties in the region. It is not in the interest of the United States uh, to have uh, uh, the uh, supremacy of uh, Russia in the region. But this security cover in the GCC remains because the United States knows the danger of any possible hegemony by Russia in the GCC. And there is another concern or danger that was referred to by Vali Nasser, which is the Chinese danger. He said that China represents the most important expansionist danger. And the United States wants to put an end to this expansion by China, by China in the Pacific. And uh, uh, China is reinforcing its relationship with Pakistan and China, and also in Afghanistan. And this is to reinforce his theory. In 2011, gas has become one of the most sources used or uh, extracted within the United States, and this is due to non-traditional, non-conservative source of gas. So the traditional sources of gas is in increase year after year, and estimates show that it is going to be a very important player in the exportation of energy and the impact on the economy for the exportation of the United States of oil and, and gas would be very much negative on Qatar economically. But it, it is not going to be catastro catastrophic because this uh, Qatar needs uh, uh, the barrel to be 65 dollars and it can reach 81 dollars and this is very much lower than the prices of oil today. These figures can be distorted due to the works of the infrastructure that are being taken place now. And if these infrastructure pro uh, projects are not continuing, the prices would decrease even further. It is not probable that these prices would not decrease beyond these uh, figures, because it goes if it goes beyond uh, the extraction of energy, non-conservative energy, which is uh, now uh, discovered in the United States, so would not be feasible economi economically. So it would be more expensive to extract these sources of energy than selling them in the market. We are talking about the second countries in the region. The impact of the decrease in the prices would be most on Iran because Iran needs 126 per barrel for them to reach a kind of a break even or a balance in the uh, budget and this is going to destabilize the situation in Iran and this destabilization if it takes place it is going to be a security threat to Qatar which uh, would manifest in a would be manifested in a direct threat by Iran or other regions the state of Qatar would be impacted by the weakness uh, economic weakness in Qatar and this is going to incre decrease uh, the economic exchange or commercial exchange and this is going to decrease the interest of the United States in the region and any uh, commercial exchange if uh, Qatar cannot find a way in order to preserve its uh, economic capabilities and development in other sectors. Uh, certain reports show that in 2020, the uh, exports uh, from the United States of gas uh, and from Canada would be equal to the gas exported from uh, Qatar. And this is going to have an impact on, the, on Qatar because if that uh, is being exported to markets that uh, uh, that uh, Qatar exports to, and this is one of the main markets uh, for exports, gas exports uh, by the state of Qatar. It is probable that this competition on the different markets between the United States and Qatar 
can lead to a decrease in the prices, uh, which are already low, and this will have a negative impact on the budget uh, of the state of Qatar, and competition would have a negative impact on the relationship between the United States and Qatar if the competition is very high and the impacts are very negative on the state of Qatar. And the state of Qatar recognizes uh, the danger of this since 2012, and this has led them to cancel their plan to export uh, gas uh, to North America, and they have decided only to export it to eastern part of Asia, and this contract lasts for 20, last, sorry, for 20 years. According to economic statistics, uh, the state of Qatar relies on uh, import from the United States more than the United States relies on the imports uh, from uh, Qatar, whereas it is in uh, buying uh, uh, weapons or water security and so on. And this reliance shows, in case uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, interest decreases, uh, Qatar will face these difficulties unless they reach uh, agreements with the neighboring countries. I would like to talk about the steps that can be taken by the state of Qatar for them to be able to overcome these difficulties or to avoid them. It is very important for the state of Qatar to preserve its security relations with the United States because as a great power, there is no substitute to this power and there is no uh, I mean, evidence that uh, Qatar would, uh, that uh, the United States uh, w wants to hold its interest, uh, security interests in the region uh, and this relationship uh, uh, should be reinforced. The state of Qatar has many opportunities to avoid the, the impact of uh, the United States exporting gas uh, and uh, try to export uh, gas uh, from the state of Qatar to the GCC and to Turkey and uh, in order to meet their requirements. Uh, the state of Qatar never paid heed to this uh, and now it does not export gas to any GCC country except uh, the Emirates. Uh, this due to the fact uh, that there was a disagreement on the prices. But if they reach an agreement upon the price that would be, uh, I mean, uh, satisfactory to all parties, uh, this is going to have a close, uh, I mean, pipeline to these uh, different uh, geographical markets. And this uh, economic cooperation can lead to more proximity between the different GCC countries, which would make them uh, very much cooperative uh, economically. And I think this is not going to be very difficult uh, for the state of Qatar due to the increase in the need for uh, uh, for energy, especially in uh, power, uh, uh, because there would be an increase by 150%. Uh, and this also applies to Turkey that has always tried uh, to get rid of the, uh, I mean, uh, hegemony on the uh, imports of gas. Uh, and Qatar can contribute to the development and reinforcement of the relationship between uh, Turkey and the GCC countries and try to reach gradually into a security agreement between the GCC countries and uh, the uh, and Turkey since it is a member of NATO and it is one of the only countries in the region that can fill the security vacuum that can happen if there is a lack of presence or retreat from the part of the United States in the region. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, all the speakers uh, for uh, respecting the 15 minutes. Uh, I know it is very hard uh, to present a paper or summary in 15 minutes. Uh, we will move to the second part of this session, the Q&A. If you have any questions, clarifications, the floor is yours. So please uh, introduce yourself and uh, address the question to one panelist. You can uh, write down uh, the questions and uh, the last 10 minutes will be uh, to answer these questions. Thank you, Abdul Wahab Al Kassab from the Arab Center. It is not uh, a question, it's actually a statement uh, uh, to uh, Professor. To whom? Dr. Daniel Serwer. When we talk about uh, the energy, whether in the Gulf uh, or in other areas, uh, there is an interactive relationship between two factors. First of all, uh, geostrategic when it comes to the pipelines, 
and then the transportation means or the shipment means and lines. Uh, we know that uh, there, it is a problematic issue. Several uh, lines, the transport lines, go through Arab territories. So uh, we're talking about the Atlantic and then the Middle East and then the Red Sea, uh, the Aden Gulf and uh, the peak in the north. Any of these uh, points represent uh, the geographic uh, maritime area of the Arab uh, Ummah. It affects the uh, uh, supply. So please be brief. Be brief. We have several several questions. Thank you. Uh, any question? Thank you. I would like to ask uh, the question in Arabic uh, and, uh, to Dr. Abdullah, but everybody uh, can answer it. I'm not talking about the U.S. or the Gulf. It's about China. We talk as if the China has a role and wants to be influential uh, militarily in this uh, region. If allowed, China would like to play a major role uh, in the security system in this region. And all the evidence that we have do not uh, lead us to believe so. We don't have evidence that China wants to play a military or security role outside. Dr. Abdullah, how do you see Gulf countries or how do Gulf countries perceive China or the, the Chinese role? Do you really believe that uh, China wants to play a security role? Does it deal with the U.S. Uh, 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 at this level or from this perspective? Thank you. Zuhair Hamdi, the Arab uh, Center for Research Policy and Studies. To all panelists, actually, my question is not about China, but India. All of you have mentioned China, but I think uh, that India uh, has bigger interests in the region, not China, not only at the energy level, but when it comes to the employment of Indians here in the Gulf, 3 million people employed in the Gulf, 30 billion uh, US dollars are uh, remittances to uh, India, money transfers, and uh, India has a strategy when it comes to the military uh, forces and developing its capacity, especially the maritime presence. Uh, so please uh, tackle this point uh, uh, briefly. Another question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Please be brief. My question is to Dr. Daniel and uh, Dr. Frederick. When it comes to the United States of America, we know that recently, uh, since uh, the beginning of the 90s, uh, the United States uh, is uh, an international power and it leads the world. Uh, recently, we have been witnessing a new role of Russia, emerging role of Russia especially uh, during uh, the, uh, the recent crisis. Uh, so do the U.S. perceive this role as a, a serious role that would uh, take us back uh, in time uh, where we had a bipolar uh, world, uh, uh, when it comes to, especially when it comes to the conflict of interest uh, in this region? Another question? Thank you, F uh, first of all. Uh, regarding uh, Gulf countries, uh, the economic uh, interests uh, are uh, growing uh, when it comes to Asia. It's linked with uh, America. There's uh, this uh, conflict between America and uh, China. How would Gulf countries be able to balance uh, uh, their relationships between the two powers? with the increasing conflicts. Uh, <clears throat> Dave Ottaway, the Woodrow Wilson Center. Question for Sue. 
uh, for uh, Suhey Maltani. If there is a, a nuclear agreement between Iran and uh, the five, P, P5 plus one, um, what prospect do you see for any kind of cooperation between Iran and the GCC for a joint common security arrangements in the Gulf? Shukran. Shukran jazeena. So al akhir. God. Uh, the uh, statistics uh, of the International Agency, Energy Agency 2013 uh, refers to China as a, one of the three biggest importers uh, of oil from the Gulf in the world. And uh, I have my own opinion regarding this uh, matter. In 2011, we have witnessed a new uh, policy between the R Russians and the Chinese. And there is a strong uh, relation between China and Saudi Arabia when it comes to trade and military as well. My question to Dr. Abdullah. Do you expect uh, in progress of the Russian-Chinese influence in the Gulf region will be in direct uh, conflict uh, with the U.S. influence? Thank you. Uh, we are running uh, short on time, so I will uh, give you two minutes to answer uh, these questions. Dr. Abdullah. We we'll start with you. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Thank you for your questions. China is an emerging power, of course. It is undoubtedly so, and it will play a major role in the future when it comes to the security of the region. But until now, it is still not as powerful as the U.S. Today, it does not have the power of the, or the capacity of the United States when it comes to the power projection uh, that is uh, of the U.S. Of course, that might evolve in the future. And uh, when it comes to the recognition of uh, the capacity, it will take time. Of course, uh, China is uh, expanding. It's got a base in Jawadar uh, near uh, uh, the uh, Gulf, and uh, China, as well as the U.S., are seeking a partnership when it comes to the security or protecting the security or the burden sharing when it comes to the security concern of the Gulf. Sooner or later, China will become a major player in the region. And I think this applies to India as well in the future. However, we are still talking about uh, the Gulf region, a scenario of turmoil, military threats. So today we still need the major power that's got the power projection, an active power projection. So there is no alternative today, at least for now. As to the b b balancing the relationship uh, of uh, GCC countries, I think this is important for Gulf countries to do so. There is a shift in the economic uh, relationship uh, and uh, pivoting from the West and the U.S. to Asia. Asia is the biggest market of Gulf countries and the biggest trade partner. This will uh, continue and uh, will uh, uh, show us uh, different uh, changes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, excuse me, Dr. Dr. Daniel. Yes, I do believe that India, as well as China, should play a role in picking up some of the security burdens in the Gulf. Neither one w is all that anxious to do this, but I do believe that they should, and I think we should be welcoming to them. Uh, so far as Russia is concerned, uh, we're not going back to the Cold War period, but Russia is causing us a lot of grief in, in Syria, and 
under Putin, frankly, is likely to continue to cause us problems in Ukraine, in Syria, uh, wherever they get an opportunity. Uh, but I think that's a temporary situation, and it's nothing like the nuclear standoff of the Cold War period. Uh, we need to learn how to manage the Russia risk. Uh, I don't think you're faced with the problem of America-Chinese balance in the Gulf for the next 10 years at least, maybe 20. Uh, so I wouldn't worry about it too quickly. Uh, but eventually, um, you need to do, we need to do what is obvious, which is to include the Chinese in security arrangements. Thank you, Dr. Daniel. Uh, Dr. Frederick, within two minutes, please. Just to add to what was said, um, I, I do think India is, is a real potential power in this region. And, and of all the countries I mentioned or powers, I think this one has the most potential to, to take on more of the security burden, uh, powerful navy. Um, I will just caveat that with, with the sense, with the argument that, that India now is an inward looking power. I mean, they've got tremendous uh, economic problems. The new prime minister, ha I think, has a mandate to really focus on on the economy. So it's, I think, it's questionable over the near term if they're going to, you know, want to take on this this security burden. Um, regarding Russia and China, just to add to what what was said, I mean, I think we have to also remember these powers don't have the depth of of sort of cultural or institutional knowledge in this region, and I think that matters. Um, I have a friend who visited the the Chinese uh, sort of their foreign ministry academy um, for, for policy and he met some of the, the Chinese Arabists there and, and he said they were brilliant linguists but they had just studied books. They, had, they didn't have this sense of, of Arab culture. I mean, there's, there's not the institutional history of interaction in this region and I, and I think that matters in terms of how these countries can interact with, uh, with the Gulf. And the last thing I'll mention is that um, I do think the values of these countries matter increasingly in, 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 a, in, the, in terms of how they interact. I mean, both China and Russia, have, I think, have been on the wrong side of, of the Arab transitions. Um, you know, I was in Libya recently, and the, and the Libyans are very standoffish uh, to, to China because of China's stance uh, during the Libyan uprising, uh, supporting Gaddafi. And so I think these positions matter in terms of the access these countries have in, in the region. Thank you, Frederick. Yeah. Okay, with regards to um, your question about the Iranian nuclear agreement, I think that in order to have a common security agreement, you need a common threat. What the raison d'etre of NATO, the GCC was against, you know, uh, the Iraqi and Iranian threat, NATO was against the Russian threat, and I don't see a common threat to both the Gulf and Iran at the time being that would be important enough to unite them against uh, that threat and you know, increase their coordination and alliance with each other. Regarding your question uh, on India, I think India uh, was, has distanced itself from uh, uh, other uh, countries in the world and uh, its relationship with uh, Iran is uh, strategic and I don't think it would be ready to lose any soldier to protect uh, the security of the Gulf uh, against the Iranians. And uh, it's a deep-rooted uh, uh, relationship in Pakistan against uh, India for three wars. I don't know uh, whether India thinks that it's got a strategic interest with the Gulf more than Iran. When it comes to the burden sharing and China, I think it is not pr probable uh, because when you share the burden with someone, you share decisions, you share opinions, and I don't think uh, that uh, the main power in the U.S. wants to share anybody opinions or uh, decisions or, or combating uh, some uh, topics or some threats. Thank you, Mr. Sahim. Uh, at the end, I would like to thank you all uh, for attending and thank the panelists. Thank you.